Hello, thank you everyone for coming and be very welcome to the fifth ECR Biomics seminar of this year. Let me introduce you to our speaker of today. Her name is Erin Harvey. She's currently a fourth year postdoc at the University of Sydney, Australia in the lab of Eddie Holmes. The Holmes lab studies the emergence of evolution of RNA viruses and Eddie works on the virons of Australian mammals and parasitic invertebrates with a particular interest in effects of changing land use and anthropogenic activities on the virons of endangered native species. Erin did, uh, did her undergraduate studies at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, majoring in immunology and medical microbiology, and did her honors thesis at the Inhomes uh, Cancer Center within the Genomic Informatic Lab under the supervision of Marshall Ginger. From there, she joined Eddie Holmes Lab at the University of Sydney and began her PhD studies in 2016. Erin began doing virus discovery using metatranscriptomics in her PhD studies and did viral studies on Australian ticks and fleas, koalas, Antarctic penguins, and their ticks. She also worked on a project using drones to capture whale blow which we extracted total RNA from and identified novel viruses. Erin completed her PhD studies in 2019 and has been exploring her interest in mammalian virus since then. She's currently spending two months collaborating with Sebastian Lequimes lab at the University of Groningen to learn more about endogenous viral elements. And the title of her talk today is The Utility of Phylogeny in Virus Discovery, Host Association, Taxonomy, and Disease Potential. So Erin, whenever you're ready, you can please kindly share your presentation. Yeah. Okay, is that all good? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so... Uh... My name's Erin, I'm from the University of Sydney, but I am currently in the Netherlands. Um, hence, you can see that there's still daylight outside. If I was in Sydney, it would be midnight right now. So thank you to the people from Australia who have also joined today. Um, and this talk will be quite similar to the one that I gave uh, at the RDRP summit, but uh, I will go more in depth on things like methods um, and some more examples uh, of uh, where phylogenetic trees are really useful. Uh, in virus discovery. Um, so for most of us, we are doing our virus discovery entirely bioinformatically these days, um, which means that we're not really left with a lot of options uh, for analysis techniques to put our virus sequences into context. Um, and we are pretty much restricted to comparative uh, uh, analysis. Um, and in the words of the boss man, uh, phylogeny is the obvious method. Um, Guillermo pretty much uh, introduced me pretty well. Um, so my background uh, is I've, I've always wanted to study virus evolution um, and that's why I've been with Eddie Holmes for so long in Sydney. Um, so uh, for those who are not familiar with this figure, um, I think that this uh, figure from Meng Shi's uh, 2016 paper, Redefining the Invertebrate Biosphere, really captures the impact of metatranscriptomic virus discovery on our understanding of virus diversity. Um, and for those not familiar, the red lines indicate the viruses that were identified in this study, uh, and uh, the gray lines are the viruses that were in the reference database at the time. Um, so as you can see, like, Groups like the Bacorna virales uh, were dramatically affected by this one study, let alone all the other studies that have come um, uh, along behind it. Um, and groups like that Mono Chu group that um, at the time was very new, um, it, now the taxonomy has completely changed uh, entirely because of uh, metatranscriptomic virus discovery. Um, but on the flip side of that coin, um, the databases that we rely upon uh, are still very much manually curated. Um, and uh, when they were set up, um, 
they were sort of set up to handle maybe a few hundred entries per year, and many of those would have been a resequencing of known viruses, whereas now they're receiving thousands of entries per year of completely novel viruses. And considering that they still rely on manual curation, that leads to a lot of incomplete and incorrect entries in uh, these databases. And when we have incomplete and incorrect entries, these can compound when people are relying upon BLAST alone to assign things like taxonomy and potential host associations. Um, and this is one such example. Um, I hope Sabrina doesn't mind me using this example again, uh, but I came across this virus while I was looking for an outgroup for a tree that I'll talk about uh, in more detail later. Um, and this virus was uh, assigned as a hand-like virus by the author, but NCBI has uh, assigned the taxonomy as being within the mono. Uh, uh, mononega viralis. Um, and for those who don't know, hantaviruses are actually within the bunya viralis, which is a different group of negative stranded RNA viruses. Um, and given how uh, divergent this virus is, I mean, it's hard to tell if it really should be within this group or not. Um, and I have also put it in a tree with other bunya viruses. And uh, it does look equally as divergent uh, in this tree as well. So when you're working with highly divergent viruses, it can be quite difficult to assign taxonomy. And just using blast hits um, can be problematic. Um, so I'm going to go into some examples of um, uh, where there are errors in the databases and how to deal with those things, um, and also how to use phylogenetics to uh, analyze your uh, novel virus sequences. Um, so first I'll talk about an SRA mining project um, that I've been working on, uh, and secondly I'll talk about a project that I did in collaboration with a group of ecologists that were sampling uh, fecal samples from small mammals in Tasmania um, to look at the effects of land use on the virums of these animals. Um, I'll go through the workflow now just to get it out of the way because it is pretty similar for both projects. Um, so our lab does total RNA extractions um, and the kit we use really depends on the type of sample that we're working with because our lab works with a huge range of sample types. But generally we will go with the Kyogen RNA Easy Plus kit. Um, that kit is pretty good, it can handle most things. Um, and I use those for the fecal samples I'll talk about later. Um, but I also use the Kaya Shredder columns with uh, these samples as well, just to try and get absolutely everything I could out of the sample because we weren't left with a lot to work with. Um, we then do a ribosomal RNA depletion. And by we, I mean, we send our samples off to a company called AGRF in Melbourne and they do our library preps for us. Uh, and then we sequence on an overseek. And once we get our sequencing back, we do uh, sort of typical QC, uh, trim our reads and do a, no a de novo assembly. Um, and at the moment I'm using a mega hit, um, but there's quite a few different uh, de novo assemblers out there. And um, uh, I think there's a couple of papers comparing them. Um, I'll go into my virus discovery pipeline now, but I just uh, want to point out that uh, even within our group alone, people use uh, different methods depending on what kind of viruses you're looking for. And for me, working on um, mainly mammals, uh, this, this works for me. Um, so I use Diamond Blast X uh, with a custom database of virus proteins that was put together by Justine Sharon when she was in our lab. Um, and that collects uh, anything that's got any kind of... Uh, um, amino acid sequence similarity to a virus protein, um, but this data set will be filled with a lot of false positives. Um, so then I remove false positives with a, a BLAST N against uh, the NCBI NT database, and I'll remove everything that has sequence similarity to something that's not a virus. So I'm left with uh, things that have no uh, nucleotide sequence similarity to anything and things that have sequence similarity to virus sequences. Um, and then with that data set, I will then uh, do another Diamond Blast X against NCBI's NR database. Uh, and I will uh, then take out all of uh, the hits that still are hitting to virus proteins. Um, but at that stage, I will look at things like the, uh, the E value and uh, the length of my contig um, and the length of the, the sequence similarity as well. Um, and then I will manually have a look at those contigs um, uh, 
ingenious and this gives me the opportunity to check for complete RRFs um, and to check that uh, I'm seeing the genome structure that I would expect. Um, and also if you're getting fragments, um, multiple fragments of a virus that don't assemble into a nice full genome, um, you can try and do a reassembly in Genius or find other missing contigs. Um, and also with uh, segmented viruses, try to match up and get all of the segments that you need. Um, I will then do a web blast with those contigs. Um, a, just as another check to make sure that I'm not seeing anything like host proteins or um, things associated with bacteria or plants or any other thing, any other uh, false positives that could be in my sample. Um, this will also give me an idea of what the taxonomy could be of this virus, because sometimes just using the top five blast hits doesn't give you a lot of information. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then once I've decided what taxonomy I think the virus will be, uh, I use NCBI virus to collect all of the RDRP sequences, um, but that can be quite pro problematic as anyone who uses NCBI, NCBI virus would know, um, because uh, the RDRP can be labelled as many, many different things, um, and you even have to uh, account for the fact that there could be uh, spelling mistakes. Um, so once I have uh, an input file that I'm happy with, I will then uh, produce my alignment. Um, and generally MAFT is the tool that I'll use. Um, and uh, you can play around with the parameters that you use. Um, but sometimes if you're working with um, particularly more um, divergent viruses, uh, you might need to play around with the tools that you use uh, and uh, explore something like Clustal or even the aligner in Genius. Um, uh, I'll then trim my alignment and I always, always, always manually assess my alignments um, to see if uh, the alignment tool I've used looks like it's the correct one. Uh, if it looks like I've uh, uh, taxonomically assigned my virus correctly um, and also to see if I need to change my parameters. Um, and then once I'm happy with my alignment, uh, I will put it into IQ tree and use model finder, um, but I will always check what model it has uh, picked for me uh, and make sure that it makes sense in terms of um, uh, what I would expect it to choose. And um, I got a question at RDRP about how you decide if the model is right. And all I can say is Google is your friend um, and to read uh, other papers where people have uh, built trees on the same sort of family. So now we'll get into the interesting stuff. Um, so the first uh, project I'll talk about is this SRA mining project uh, where we screened all of the DASI urid uh, RNA-seq libraries that were on um, the NCBI SRA. And that was 446 libraries. Um, and the DASI urids are a group of Australian marsupial carnivores. Um, and uh, marsupials are mammals that um, uh, have like a pouch that they, uh, uh, grow their young in, um, and they're very common in Australia. Um, and so we pass this to, through a uh, more liberal pipeline that is put together by my student, um, John Mifsud. Uh, and then I put it through my pipeline, which is a little bit stricter just for personal preference. And we removed all of the eaves. Um, and we know quite a lot about the eaves in marsupials, thanks to Emma Harding's paper. So we identified 15 novel viruses through this screening um, and surprisingly, most of them are actually DNA viruses. Um, and I think this could be because of uh, these libraries were generated not for the purpose of virus discovery. And so there could have been steps in the library prep like polyase selection that would remove a lot of uh, viruses. Um, and so, but we did identify two Delta viruses and three RNA viruses. Uh, and these were across Numbats, Antichinus, uh, Fat Tailed Dunnart, and Tassie Devils. Um, and you can see there's an overrepresentation of the Antichinus and the Devils. And that's um, indicative of how many SRA libraries there are available for those species. Um, and they are more studied because of their biology. So I'll start off with talking about this, uh, these Delta viruses. Um, so uh, up until quite recently, Delta viruses were thought to uh, only infect humans and to have emerged in humans. Um, and that was 
proven to be incorrect through metatranscriptomics. Um, there was a Delta virus identified in birds um, by my colleague Michelle Wiley and uh, one in a snake, I think. Um, and since the, then, uh, SRA mining, um, uh, particularly using the Serratus web tool, has uh, identified a, a few other mammalian um, Delta viruses. And we identified uh, these two and they form a little monophyletic clade, which is quite interesting. Um, and I just want to point out that uh, I did use Laura Bergner's uh, paper as a reference to build this tree. Um, so even if you do have a lot of experience in uh, phylogenetics, sometimes it is best to look at what somebody else has done to help you, uh, to help influence uh, the way you build a tree because um, building this tree can be quite difficult. Um, but yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if we can sequence more marsupials and see if uh, this sort of monophyletic clade holds up. Um, so we also identified two novel hepasiviruses, uh, one in an antichinus uh, and one in a numbat. And uh, the antichinus virus clusters with a bandicoot hepasivirus um, that I actually identified from uh, a, a blood mill of a tick um, a few years ago in my PhD. Um, and uh, of note, the marsupial hepaces don't cluster together. So there's also uh, this cluster down here of a koala and a possum. Um, and my theory is that uh, this uh, uh, difference could be because uh, bandicoots are omnivores and they also sort of um, scrounge around on, uh, on the bush floor um, and so do antichinus whereas uh, koalas and possums are tree dwelling uh, and they're herbivores so this um, difference in hepasiviruses could be that there's been multi multiple spillovers, spillovers into marsupials um, and uh, that could be due to their uh, differences in environmental niche um, but you might have noticed the other novel virus is sitting all the way down here, and that's our numbat hepasivirus. Um, and numbats have quite interesting biology in that they exclusively eat termites, um, and they are the closest relative to the Tasmanian tiger. Um, and they are now only exist in two national parks in the southwest of Australia. Um, but that doesn't really explain why this virus would be clustering down at the bottom of the tree with a group of viruses that is associated with birds and reptiles. Um, and I think that that could be just that this virus is so divergent um, that it, there's not a lot of um, bootstrapping support for these nodes down here. Um, and so until we sort of fill in that, that evolutionary space between um, it and the other mammalian viruses, we don't really know where it actually sits in the tree. Um, and as you can see, the herpasiviruses do generally sort of cluster by host. Um, but you may have noted, noticed this blue line down here that sort of bucks that trend. Um, so I noticed this virus while building this tree, um, and this virus uh, is listed in NCBI as having a mosquito as its host. Um, and for those who know anything about hepasiviruses, you'll know that they're uh, not vector borne um, and they're not associated with invertebrates. So this virus looks quite suspicious. Um, and given the fact that it has come from sequencing of a mosquito, I would be concerned that this may have actually come from the blood mill of that mosquito rather than um, replicating within that mosquito itself. And I think that's where we need to be careful when we assign a host to a virus, because should someone come along with another novel virus, they might assume that it could be uh, vector borne or verte invertebrate infecting when in fact, this is just a mistake. But on the flip side of that, um, sometimes you also identify highly divergent viruses that buck that trend. Um, and this virus that I uh, was identified in a library of uh, devil facial tumor disease, which is a cancer that affects Tasmanian devils, um, I 100% thought this was contamination to begin with. Um, and this is where the benefit of uh, the our uh, whole RNA sequencing approach comes in, because we can actually have a look at the um, the composition of the whole library to see if there's any potential sources of contamination that could explain this virus. Um, and so this was cell line sequencing, so it's kind of unlikely that we would have any sort of invertebrate here, um, but you never know, you know, maybe a fly in the lab fell into the culture or I don't know, anything could happen. Um, 
but we didn't see any source of contamination. Uh, we use a program called CC Metagen uh, to have a look at the composition of the libraries and it spits out a nice little corona uh, graph. Uh, so you can uh, sort of have a look around and see if there's anything that could be potential uh, contamination. This virus was also quite abundant. It was the most ab abundant virus in this study. Um, and this might not seem like a uh, huge abundance, but for viruses, uh, this is um, pretty, pretty impressive. Um, and it's also extremely divergent with only 24.3% amino acid sequence similarity at the RDRP. Um, and that was to uh, an invertebrate virus. Um, it's also looking like this virus is exogenous. We have a nice long contig with a really nice ORF. Um, but two viruses were discovered in invertebrates and thus far they have largely been uh, only identified in invertebrates. But recently there has been uh, the description of a new genus called the Pisky Chew, which includes uh, some fish associated viruses and two viruses from snakes. And there's also a paper that I'm not sure if it has been published yet, but is out as a preprint where they identified um, uh, chew like viruses in turtles and a lot of these have uh, not only a disease association but an association with neurological disease um, and there are eaves of uh, chew like nuclear capsid proteins in Tasmanian devils um, but that doesn't look like it's anything to do with our sequence it, it's quite divergent from our sequence um, and uh, it's you know full of stop codons whereas we have a nice big ORF um, and it wasn't, I was still on the fence about this and thinking that it was most likely uh, contamination uh, of some sort until uh, my PhD student, John Miff said, reviewed the manuscript and he came across a paper that suggested that DFTD uh, is of Schwann cell origin and Schwann cells are part of the PNS. So this holds up this idea that maybe vertebrate two viruses are associated with the nervous system and definitely makes me feel a little bit better about uh, um, suggesting that this could be the first mammalian two virus. So now on to the other project. So um, uh, our, our uh, ecologist uh, collaborators from uh, Tasmania came to us with uh, the question of whether um, uh, things like agricultural, land use, uh, forestry um, could have an impact on the virums of native species. And so they uh, went out and did a whole lot of trapping. So these uh, fecal samples were all taken from trapped caged animals. So we can be certain that the fecal sample is actually coming from uh, our target host. Um, and they looked at uh, feral animals like cats and black rats, as well as native species. Um, and that included carnivores like uh, devils and quolls, as well as herbivores like um, brush-tailed possums and swamp rats. Um, and so we pulled all of the, extracted all of the RNA from these individually and then pulled them by collection location, land use type and species. And you might notice on our map down here that we've sort of excluded this southwestern area of Tasmania. And that's because that's one giant national park essentially. Um, and it's actually where Alone Australia is filmed. So if you want to see what the environment actually looks like and what some of the wildlife look like, um, I suggest checking that out. So um, we identified a whole lot of virus uh, contigs in our libraries. Um, because we're looking at fecal samples, that's sort of expected, um, particularly, particularly when you're looking at carnivores, um, because they're, uh, they're really scavengers, so they get into everything. Um, so I decided that maybe it would be more useful just to look at mammalian associated viruses in this case. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how I decided what to include and what to exclude. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm just gonna talk about the Porn of Raleigh's. Um, a, because we identified quite a few uh, interesting species in here, um, but also because I think it's uh, an order that people have quite a lot of uh, problems with uh, understanding uh, the taxonomy. Um, and uh, there's quite a few incorrect, uh, incorrectly identified uh, Picornoviridae that are actually just Picornoviralis. Um, so it's important to note that there are only two families within the Picornoviralis that are mammalian associated, and that is the Picornoviridae and the Calisiviridae. Um, so it can be quite difficult to determine if your novel virus belongs within one of these two families. Um, 
this is the top blast hits of one of my novel viruses. And as you can see, um, the top hits don't really tell us a lot. The top hit is my uh, pet hate, Ribovirea SP. But we also have some, um, some hits that look like they could be real Picornaviridae, um, Hepatovirus, Gallivirus, Enterovirus. These are all uh, Picornaviridae. Um, but we also have a real, uh, you know, weird result here, seeing some Nanaviridae SP, which are a completely different family of viruses that infect fungi. So I put uh, these, this blast result in a tree. Um, and as you can see, we have our nanas clustering up here at the top, the Picornaviridae clustering here, and then our more divergent, um, more invertebrate associated viruses down the bottom here. So it does look like um, despite the, the second hit being a hepatovirus, uh, our virus is probably not vertebrate associated. And so this is one that I would have excluded. Um, and just on a larger scale, um, this is how I identified. Uh, so first I would use a blast screen to, to exclude the things that are obviously not Picornaviridae. Um, but then with those things that had sort of confusing top hits, uh, I would put them in a tree and use that to exclude things. Um, this tree is obviously very, very difficult to look at um, from this resolution. Um, but you can see there's, there's a few sort of red lines uh, around there that are in um, the wrong spot. So they would be excluded. Um, and again, for the sake of time, I'm just going to talk about the Khaleesi viridae that we identified in this study. Um, so we identified uh, seven Khaleesi viruses in our study, two of them having been previously identified, um, and that is canine BC virus and uh, RHDV2. Um, and this was in a, uh, a range of samples pretty much covering all of the species that we sampled here. And this includes um, feral and uh, native species, as well as herbivores and carnivores. Um, and so we, because a lot of uh, Khaleesi viruses can be associated with gastrointestinal issues, um, we asked our collaborators if they saw any signs of disease because they had actually tracked the animal. Um, they had done a sort of general health check um, and also because they're sampling feces, um, they could tell if there were any signs that something was wrong. Um, and they said there were no signs in any of the animals um, that they were uh, sick. Um, and so it's unlikely that things like this canine BC virus are actually um, causing disease in uh, Tassie devils. Sorry, TD is Tassie devil. Um, but it's very likely that this is rather coming from a terrible habit that Tassie devils have, and that is eating the feces of other animals. Um, and we also identified a lot of human associated viruses like human rotavirus in the Tassie devil feces. And we think that's because they go to campsites and get into the sewage systems, which is pretty disgusting. So don't be kissing Tassie devils. Um, and across the other species, it's quite difficult for us to say whether these viruses are truly infecting our sampled host or if they're coming from the diet. But in the case of the brush-tailed possum, considering that they're a herbivore, we might be more likely to suggest that this could be coming from the brushy. Um, but you never know because they'll also get into anything they can get their hands on. Um, the most concerning thing that we found here was RHDV2, um, and that is rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus 2, which is used as a biocontrol agent in Australia to control the rabbit population. Um, and there has been quite a lot of concern that this uh, virus could jump into native species. And if it had the same um, uh, same effect on native species as it does on rabbits, this would be quite concerning um, because a lot of native species are already at risk of extinction and, and a virus like this could completely wipe them out. Um, so that's when it's important to look at the biology of your virus. Um, and RHDV2, it, it affects the liver of infected animals uh, and you would not expect, it to see, uh, ex expect to see this in feces. Um, but we're lucky enough to have an expert on RHDV2 in our lab, um, Jackie Ma, and she built this beautiful tree for me um, and showed that uh, our RHDV2 was indeed clustering with other uh, RHDV2 isolates taken from rabbits in Tasmania. Um, and uh, it's not looking like this virus has 
change significantly in order to jump into a new host. Um, and the fact that it's only been found in faeces also suggests that uh, it's not infecting the host um, that we've sampled, but rather is coming from the fact that the animals that uh, we've found this in are scavengers. And so they're finding dead rabbits and eating uh, them and they have a, a, a high titer of vi virus. Um, and this was, uh, concerning because we actually had 25% of total reads being uh, RHDB2 in one of our devil libraries, which is an absolutely insane amount. Um, so I'm just going to summarize what uh, we're doing and what we're doing in the future. So the marsupial carnivore SRA paper should hopefully be out soon once Eddie gives it the okay. Um, and the second project I've talked about, we're actually um, doing uh, ecological analysis um, and using VOTUs for that. And that's for the purposes of our collaborators. But then I will also do a virus characterization paper where I put all of these viruses into trees uh, and follow the ICTV rules and make all of those sequences available online um, and try and provide some context. Um, we also have blood samples collected during the faecal sampling, uh, which will be quite interesting to, if we see any overlap between the viruses we see in the feces and the viruses we see in the blood. Um, but it's not a perfect overlap. And um, we do have some other species as well, like bandicoots, which will be interesting to look at. Um, and I also want to use uh, the serratus palm scan uh, tool to try and see if I can identify any more chew like viruses similar to my devil chew virus um, in any other mammalian libraries. Um, and just since I have a little bit of time, I just want to uh, advertise my PhD students and the lovely work that they've done. Um, so this work was done by John Mifsed. He's the guy on the left. Um, and he builds these um, beautiful tangograms uh, to look for cross species transmission events in uh, the viruses he identifies. And so uh, he extended the host range of the Flaviviridae using SRA mining. Um, so he found pestiviruses in amphibians, reptiles, and reef in fish. And he also identified a uh, potentially novel cross species transmission event between bats and rodents. But he wants me to say that it's very potential. Um, and also uh, Vince, who is Mr. Fish in our lab, um, he put out this beautiful paper looking at uh, doing uh, sequencing of fish collected from an area of 100 square metres uh, in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and he was looking for signs of cross-species transmission in the viruses that he identified. Um, and he saw a little evidence of cross-species transmission um, and saw that there was more diversity in um, the smaller Fish. I'm not going to try to name them, but um, which is interesting because they have very short lifespans and grow very rapidly. And so perhaps there's uh, a bit of a, um, a payoff between that, uh, between the rapid growth uh, and um, being able to uh, fight off viruses. Um, and he also identified a couple of virus in this pesky chew group. Um, and he'll have a paper coming out uh, hopefully soon that he's done in collaboration with a group in Switzerland where they've sequenced uh, a whole lot of cichlid fish uh, from a single African lake. And he's looked at the viruses in those fish and looked for um, patterns of cross-species transmission in those as well. Um, so just to summarise, um, we're pretty limited in the type of analysis that we can do uh, when we're just working with virus sequences. Um, and I think phylogeny is a, a great way to get a lot of information with quite minimal input and also using tools that are, are very well described um, and easy to access as well. Um, I want everyone to keep in mind that you can't just trust everything that's on NCBI um, and that building trees is a great way to check things like host association and taxonomy. Um, and if you're very new to phylogenetics, um, don't be afraid, read lots of papers. A lot of people are now publishing their alignments when they publish their papers. Um, so I would suggest looking at those alignments, trying to recreate them yourself, um, but don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, and there's a lot of courses out there as well to keep an eye out for. Um, so I just want to thank uh, Mena and Ancha who provided me with the fecal samples um, and everyone in the homes lab. Thank you so much, Erin. Incredibly interesting talk.
So the chat went busy really, really soon. So I'm just going to start scrolling up to see who was first asking. Yeah, Jean Claude Macangara, uh, you have several questions. Would you mind to go over them? Uh, yep, that's fine. Um, so the first is um, for. Oh. oh, I mean, I was asking the the person. Oh, he who, can. Yeah, who sorry. Was the question, or if he's not already there, Jean Claude, are you there? I uh, think yes, yes, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation and for this topic, which is really interesting. Uh, hopefully, I'm working also in the same on the same topic, but I'm working uh, I'm working on protocol of metagenomic uh, to discover novel viruses, and I'm using uh, uh, nanopore. But also, I'm planning also to develop a bioinformatic pipeline, which can be easily deployed in a limited resource region. So that's why I have uh, many questions about uh, how you proceed. Uh, maybe the first question was about uh, your protocol, your bioinformatic protocol. Uh, how do you proceed? How do you have do you cast have you customized one pipeline, or you just go from one pipeline or from one uh, tool to another tool, and after that, when you have your your outputs, then you can go for phylogenetic analysis. Um, yep. So we're lucky enough to have access to. Um, the University of Sydney server. So we have um, quite a lot of computational power uh, at our hands and also a lot of storage space, um, which helps with a lot of the SRA mining projects, because obviously if you're downloading all of these uh, libraries and assembling them. Um, I, but I do think the most efficient way is when you're downloading, after you go to the next step, have a, a well thought out pipeline that deletes the file from the previous step when you no longer need it. And that way you cut down on your, um, your storage uh, requirements. Um, we uh, have uh, automated pipelines that go um, from the, the step of trimming uh, assembly um, all the way through to like a final data set um, that'll be in the form of something like a CSV file that we'll then manually have a look through. Um, Unfortunately, because uh, depending on what types of viruses you're looking at, um, a lot of the reference databases are becoming more and more like muddy and it's harder to automatically pull things out based on sequence similarity. Um, like that Chew virus, there's no way I would have pulled that out if I had an automated pipeline because I would have thought that Chew viruses were invertebrate associated. Um, but also you could be getting a lot of false positives if uh, you're using the reference database of say Picornaviridae because there's a lot of non-mammalian sequences in there. So unfortunately, I don't think it's possible to completely have, you know, one lovely pipeline that just spits out a tree at the end. Um, but that that first section of our, of our workflow is in a pipeline. Um, and then for the phylogenetics, again, I think it's at the moment quite manual. Um, it would be great to try and develop some sort of uh, method, maybe through utilizing something like AI, uh, to try and uh, A, build your uh, input data sets, because it's quite, unless you're always looking at the same families, it's quite difficult to build those input data sets because so many viruses are unclassified. So potentially the viruses most similar to your virus might be missed if you're just automatically pulling down by assigned taxonomy. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, I think. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question was, is all, was about uh, the method you use for RNA depletion, uh, uh, RNA depletion. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe I could go also. Uh, do you only use? Uh, do you only look for RNA viruses or also DNA? Uh, another question. So maybe I can finish and let other people going on. 
So, uh, do you do uh, the protocol? Your protocol is it for the whole genome, or you just uh, look for reads which uh, are related to various viruses, and then you store by there? Or after having that, those reads, do you also develop or maybe primaries or uh, to look for the to amplify the whole genome? Over. Yep. Um. So. Uh, for the R RNA depletion, um, that's done using the Illumina kit, but we don't do any of that in-house um, because it's quite difficult to get a good setup for um, building libraries. We find that it's easier to outsource that for us. Um, uh, also, so we sequence everything. We just do a ribosomal RNA depletion and then we do short read sequencing. So we're not getting full genomes. We have to do that de novo assembly step. Um, and you're not always gonna get nice full genomes. Sometimes you will just get fragments. Um, depending on how interested you are in the virus you found, we might go back, design primers and PCR um, and the viruses in Vince's paper, those have all been PCR'd, I think except for one where he didn't have any sample left. Um, but yeah, we're, we do uh, incidentally identify DNA viruses just because you see those transcribed genes sometimes. And uh, I actually found uh, more DNA viruses than RNA viruses in that SRA screening project, which is interesting. Um, but you never get the full genome, obviously. So then sometimes it's better to go back uh, and do some targeted DNA sequencing if you want to try and get the full genome. But obviously when you're working with SRA, you have no options. Thank you very much. Maybe for other question, I can send you an email. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Uh, so next question was formulated by Luis Tataje Lavanda. Would you mind to read your question, Luis? Hello. 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 Uh, I'm from Peru. Uh, sorry for my English. Uh, I prefer to read my uh, question. Um, thanks, Eri. It's very impressive your presentation, very informative, for, especially in my case. I am very interested in this kind of study of metagenomics. I, I try to start to, to study uh, for the development or to find a new variants of virus. Virus uh, not only for uh, uh, men or for people. Uh, you see, um, the two for animals. Um, in this moment, we uh, have uh, nanopore technologies that uh, quality is improved you know, before before uh, uh, not so good. Um, but my my question is more uh, about how do you determine that the sequence is from a specific new virus or maybe could be an uh, artifact uh, because I think the different different programs or software have a uh, determinate uh, parameters and could be uh, generate errors uh, into the de novo assemblies. The hope is your perspective for determinate could be real or not real. What is the cutoff? Um, yep. So. Again, it's quite a manual process of looking uh, at the the seek the contig that we get. Are we seeing a full genome? What sort of fragment? How how big are the fragments we're getting? Um, I tend to eliminate anything that's too short. So anything shorter than say six hundred nucleotides is definitely um, out of the question. Um, we also always look for a, a complete RDRP if possible. Um, uh, you also, um, I know this is the most annoying thing to say, but you get a feel for it once you've uh, been doing it for a while. Um, and that's unfortunately just through following false uh, false leads. And um, I think once you put things into trees, you get a better idea as well. Um, but generally, I think to begin with, you want to be getting nice full genomes um, and you want to be using your uh, BLAST pipeline to look for sequence similarity to other viruses. Um, also, depending on your host, there might be information out there about uh, endogenous viruses. Um, 
uh, and I'm actually over in the Netherlands to work with Sebastian Lakeem uh, on trying to find out a way that we could potentially do some sort of scoring system to see if uh, a virus that we find through metatranscriptomics is likely exogenous or endogenous. Um, but it, it is very difficult. Uh, unfortunately, it does come down to a bit of a manual approach. Does that does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, thanks. And other question is uh, uh, number four is, do you think in nowadays uh, we can found a new variant of virus uh, on database of SRA and ANA? Is possible and is possible to to uh, found uh, to go, to put in a new paper? Is valid? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Our lab has done a couple of these types of papers, and um, uh, Artem's tool Serratus is very useful as well. So that's a web-based tool. So if you have um, a, a particular virus family that you're interested, you can use uh, Serratus to screen the SRA for particular RDRP signals, and then you can reduce the number of SRA libraries that you have to screen. Um, so instead of looking at absolutely everything and, and uh, assembling and analyzing thousands and thousands of libraries, you can sort of target your approach more um, to just the libraries that have some sort of signal. Um, and I think it's very valid to reuse somebody else's data. Most of the data that I used in my mining project is has been developed for um, looking at the facial tumor in devils um, and uh, looking at the biology of antikinases. Uh, and then the numbat one was because they were doing a genome and they wanted a transcriptome to match it. Um, and there were only three libraries and we still found that hepasivirus. Um, so I think uh, in the same turn, like when we do any sequencing, we put our libraries up so that if somebody else is interested in maybe the plant viruses or the invertebrate viruses or something to do with the transcriptome of that animal, they can use our data as well. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's very valid to be able to use SRA. And even if you're doing a sequencing project yourself, I think it's a useful tool to go and look at what's also available because you might find other things there as well. Okay, thanks. Very informative. Thanks. Thank you. Next question is from Ella Tali. Hi. Hi. Um, nice to see you again. Uh, so, oh. um, yeah, I was. I wanted to ask about your reciprocal blast approach. So, yeah, I, I work in soil, and diversity of viruses in soil is just ginormous and running diamond. I mean, diamond is fast, but it's just not very sustainable. So I was wondering mm -hmm. what's your opinion about doing the same thing, but with HMMs instead. So you could get HMMs of viruses from VOG or any of the RDRP tools. And then to eliminate false positives, you can use PFAM or KEG. So what's, what's your take on this? Yeah, I definitely think that that's probably the way forward for big studies like that, especially when you're looking at those really, really, really divergent viruses that have never really been studied before. Um, I think uh, Justine Sharon and Sabrina Sadiq are probably better people to talk to about that. Um, they're also from my lab, but yeah, uh, within the sphere of looking at mammals, you're really, you know, looking at a very narrow window compared to the true diversity of viruses. Thank you, it was a great talk. Thank you. Um, I think this question is already answered from Jean-Claude. Luis Jensen has a question, I think. Um, hello, hi, Dr. Javi, great talk. Um, please forgive me if I didn't understand some part of this, but you found some viruses associated with Tasmanian devils, and uh, you've mentioned at a brief point the, the transmissible cancers. And so I work with the uh, viral discovery too with uh, viromics, but also I have a, a little foot on viral epidemiology. And so I was wondering whether, I was thinking whether the two viruses or any other virus you found could have any sort of epidemiological link with the cancers, given that these cancers are a major threat to the conservation of these species. If there is any sort of plans on trying to elaborate 
like if there are any of these viruses can be used as a marker for the contacts with diseased animals and so on. Um, yeah, so there were quite a few libraries in that study where we identified the Chew virus, but it was only in one library. I, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you how many were sequenced in that one project. Um, I also don't really know the structure of their project, but I would definitely, uh, the, the reason that I started this SRA screen was actually to look at devils and to see if there were any potential viruses that could be, you know, um, contributing factors to the pathology that they see. And I think that chew virus, like considering that it's associated with, you know, neurological disease, and then we've got it in this cancer that's associated with uh, uh, PNS cells, maybe I would love to do more work on it. Um, and uh, if anybody listening has uh, some ideas or some way of getting samples and doing some screening, we also identified papillomaviruses, a polyomavirus and a herpes virus in uh, devil samples as well, but they were from lip tissue um, and they were from both individuals that had uh, DFTD and individuals that did not have the cancer. And there didn't seem to be any kind of association with or without the disease. Um, but obviously that's, you know, very, very, you know, scraping the surface there. Um, and it would be very interesting to do more work and maybe design some primers so people could check their samples. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So next question is from Alejandro Olmedo Velarde. Uh, hello, Erin, nice presentation, Jerema. My question, it was two questions. So the main thing is you are using Megahead, which is was designed to deal with metagenomes, not necessarily metatranscriptomes. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you had compared that with a tool that was designed to deal with metatranscriptomes such as RNA spades. And second question goes for the phylogeny side. Uh, you said you just trim out, and I never heard about it, so I would like to try it. Um, normally, I have to do like trimming the alignments manually because some tools like are too strict with some virus proteins because they are just too divergent. Uh, double let's say 200 amino acids, you end up having like only 20, 30, something like that. So um, those are my two questions. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, the people in our lab have all sort of compared different aligners. I've compared, I used to be using um, uh, Trinity, which is obviously at a like way too much memory requirement and not at all designed for a metatranscriptome. Um, I've had good results using Megahit. I haven't personally used RNA spades, but I think other people in our lab have. Maybe I should uh, compare those as well um, and see if I get better results. Um, and in terms of Trimmel, um, it, it also depends on your alignment. Um, I would say an alignment of only 200 amino acids is already very short. I normally like things to be over 300 and like really, really would love it to be over 600 amino acids if possible. Um, I, I, when you're working with things that are really divergent, I, I, I don't really know what to say because I myself have struggled with this problem as well, trying to produce a nice tree. Um, but I think you need to play around with your alignment algorithm as well. Um, maybe try some different aligners like Clustal. I think uh, Mary Patron from our lab was saying that it handled some of her divergent viruses a little bit better. Um, and yeah, I think Trimmel's also going to, you, you can set parameters and tell it how much you want it to get rid of. So you can say, I want, I want it to keep, you know, 60% of my alignment or 5% of my alignment. Um, uh, and you can also set whether you want a gappy or no gappy output. So I think playing around pl with parameters is uh, the first port of call, um, but maybe uh, also check that you have all the unclassified viruses in your tree as well, because they might be close, more closely related to your novel sequence than things that are in ICTV or classified in NCBI. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Frank Onyambu, do you want to read your comment? Or it was just uh, a comment more than a question? 
my, my mine was more of a comment uh, 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 than a question. I was very impressed uh, by by the first project uh, that uh, a project will come out of mining uh, RNA seq data and actually discover viruses from that. Seems like something that we should be able to replicate in places where we don't have facilities to do uh, those those kind of studies. Uh, so thank you. Uh, very good presentation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think it's a, a great resource to um, be able to mine the SRA. And um, uh, I promise I'm not biased because I'm friends with Artem, but Serratus is also a really great tool as well. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next question is from Kane. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one is recently during a previous work, I have a, uh, it, it was a bad sample. I, um, there is a group of viruses, maybe not really known on, 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 on the field of virology, but recently it's gaining more and more interest. It's cross DNA. So there is, um, I, can, I can say one or two, um, especially the circo virus group that is well uh, known because uh, the uh, epidemic, recurrent epidemic, epidemic in pig farms, but there is a lot of unclassified virus there. So recently when I was working, I got some sequences from mega hits, uh, mega hits assembly. And when I did blast, I used diamond blast and I, go back again to do the blast manually. And I found some of these sequences have been labeled uh, with, for example, one of, uh, one of these sequences that really tricked me is the sequence was clearly sick of viruses from NCBIE. And uh, the percentage identity was around uh, 95 to 100. So, but when I construct the phylogenetic and I found uh, that is totally another, it's closer to another fam, uh, family, but not circoviruses. So how this kind of issue happens and how it, they might impact in a virus classification, because it's, it's okay for um, highly similar um, sequences you found, but what about those sequences? Uh, I still have many of them, but still, even when I take the whole order of uh, Chris DNA, Chris DNA recorder, and I went to um, uh, ICTV metadata, metadata, and I download all representative species there, and I made the whole phylogenetic tree based on the rep, um, on the rep protein, and I see most of these sequences that have that was mislabeled was completely unclassified virus. So how how to resolve this issue that are still pending there and that might create more and more difficulty for yeah for for phylogenetic relationship. And um, yeah. can I can I finish yeah. or just yeah. really you really briefly we, we have only two minutes. Okay, okay. So, so, so the second question is how the length of uh, new virus sequence impact um, the re re reliability of phylogenetic relationship? Because sometimes we use short sequence, sometimes length sequence, sometimes partial um, RDRP. So how just issue can be addressed? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that, that group of viruses, the circos, are quite often contaminants as well. Um, so we do no template controls where we, uh, we use the, um, we'll, we'll do an extraction that has no input essentially um, with the kit. Um, and we sequence that on its, its own, uh, as its own library. And we identify circoviruses in there. Um, Ashley Porter wrote a paper about it. Um, and so circoviruses, I think, can quite often be contaminants. So, you know, they might be also misassociated with a host when really 
it's sure. coming from your sequencing library. Um, mm. And I think that whole group is a complete mess, to be honest. Um, I uh, have the ability to avoid them, thankfully. Um, I really don't have the answer for that. And um, uh, at RDRP, we talked about these kinds of issues at length. Um, the fact that so many viruses uh, are misclassified and how do we rectify that? Um, and I, I think you can always write to NCBI. So you can email them and say, like, this virus is actually misclassified and then they will uh, uh, fix that. Um, I, but I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have the answer for that. I think that's a really complex question um, and it's only going to get worse as more and more people are doing metatranscriptomic virus discovery. Um, and your second question, um, you definitely want as long of a sequence as possible. As I said, lower than 300 amino acids, I think is not a very robust tree. And you'll see that in the tree that you get. Um, I think, yeah, I, I don't know that there's really an answer to that question um, in terms of uh, how to deal with it other than to maybe resequence PCR, try and get more of a genome um, and at least try to get a lot of that RDRP segment um, but yeah, I, I don't know that there's necessarily a way of doing phylogeny with anything shorter than that. Maybe if you're uh, getting that um, key signal of the RDRP, um, which uh, that could be useful, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. Okay, uh, um, one, one quick question is, uh, what, what is uh, the real benefits from for metatranscriptomic compared to metagenomic for new viral discovery. I think that's really interesting. Um, it's a lot easier to get rid of all of the host associated stuff. So um, you're getting rid of all the host genome, the host DNA, um, and you're just looking at the RNA. And when you do a ribosomal RNA depletion, you cut down the amount of uh, non-virus uh, RNA that's in your sample dramatically. I mean, you can also do a lot of other methods um, like size, uh, like doing uh, filtration or um, uh, yeah, there's there's loads of different methods, but we just, uh, our lab does total RNA sequencing and we find a lot of viruses. Um, whereas DNA, I, I, I haven't done it myself. Uh, I think you would have a hard maybe if if you know the host so say you've got a well-described host you might be able to um uh remove the host genome from your sample um sure. but most of the things i work with don't have a, a genome available thank you so much yeah. thank you ken thank you erin harvey so interesting uh i think we could he be here the whole evening but we need to finish now Thank you again. I will see you very soon in the next uh, in the next um, seminar. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.